Is this working? All right, it's working. Welcome to the FanCast, episode 35. I am your host, Brain Muffin, the Lifting Nerd, the whiny one, the nasally one. With me tonight, braving the storms of the Northeast, Liquid Model Pro. You dumb kids better get out of my property, or I will get the shotgun and call the police. <coughs> oh, God, what the fuck was that about? I don't know, man. Too much curry, I think. Oh, you're telling me. I got to stop eating this shit. Doctor keeps telling me to stop eating it. He says your tacos are bad enough, but once you start adding curry and swear, Jesus, it's like a fucking nuke in here. Yeah. Hey, speaking of which, you guys have a place called Curito up there? I don't know. I will be honest with you. Okay. I I know I know it's a chain, but I just don't know how far spread they are, but we have a few around here. And it's um it's like a Chipotle, uh, except that uh, you can get a burrito bowl type thing or, you know, bowls or bur- actual burritos or different things. But, I mean, you can get curry. You can get all kinds of stuff in that burrito. There's, like, five or six different takes on, uh, you know, some Indian stuff, some Mexican stuff, some other stuff. I, I don't know where they're all from. It's not bad. It's a little pricey, but, you know, it's not too bad. But anyway. Well, I don't know if you want to give um, people around here both Mexican and curry in the same meal. Well, that's um, not, you know, so basically you would do uh, some kind of... Um, you know, I forget what they've got, but it's it's like a curry and butter chicken, and you put your rice and you put all you know your chickpeas and all that crap, and you can put it in a in a burrito, and in a fajita, in a yeah, in a fajita. Not a, you know, it doesn't have the burrito stuff and the curry. It's basically all of the curry what you would get at an Indian restaurant, but instead of being on a plate with naan, it's rolled up into a fajita. Well, let's just be glad that Taco Bell hasn't thought of it yet. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember the last time I had something from Taco Bell. I'm sure it was about uh, five minutes from the bathroom, so, you know. Oh, God, no. I don't even want to talk about my last experience with Taco Bell. And I only did it because I had coworkers that wanted to go there. And next thing you know, I was, like, I was cursing everybody out in that room. I was just like, listen, this is the last time I eat the shit with you. I'm never, never going with you there ever again. Uh, true to my word, I have not gone back, but I feel... Like that could always be a possibility down the line. So um, for job security, I may have to uh, spend another night in the shitter, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But there you go. So uh, anyway, uh, so I do have some. Uh, let's let's cover some new th- um, pieces. Uh, okay. I've got a couple things and, uh, I'm trying to do some side verification of this one because I've, I've heard that, uh, it's true. I've heard it's not true. Yet. So deadline.com. Um, and if I click on the right tab, I could read the right story. Now this is from April 13th. So this is actually yesterday. Uh, mm-hmm. but, um, Gizmodo.com has a similar story from uh, from today, at, published at 1 p.m. And um, avnews.com, or I guess it's news.avclub.com, has a similar thing from uh, about 5 o'clock today. So what in the heck am I babbling on about? It's like, come on, old man, get to the point. So they're all reporting that st- uh, various... Uh, ways on this is that Stanley is suing a former business manager for fraud and elder abuse, uh, including one scheme to sell his blood. Now, I bring this up because I think on Thursday night's show, someone said, I don't know if it was Dion, somebody said it wasn't, some of the stuff wasn't true. Maybe it was on one of the live streams or something, but... um, On the the main show, um, um, I don't believe it was brought up. I mean, if it was brought up on the live streams... um, they didn't really go into that detail that you're mentioning. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. I just can't recall it off the top of my head yeah. too well. So from Deadline.com, we have comic book industry uh, legend Stan Lee is suing a former business manager for fraud and elder abuse in a suit that alleges such egregious claims of abuse as extracting and selling vials of Marvel Comics, I- the, the Marvel Comics icon's blood as collectibles in Las Vegas. And that's one sentence with no commas, and I know I breathe. Anyway, Lee... Now, here's a grammatical error. I'll I'll read it as it is. Lee, whom many consider the father of the modern-day superhero, 
was grieving the death of his wife of 70 years, Joan B. Lee, in late 2017 when he became the target of, quote, unscrupulous businessmen, sycophants, psycho, psycho, and opportunists, end quote, who sought to take advantage of his despondency. A suit filed in Los Angeles Superior Court alleges, I guess it's Gerardo... Olivera or Oliveras is Harald, I guess. Uh, I guess that's an H, then it's not a J. Harar, Harardo. It's easy to say as Gerardo because uh, it's J E R A R. Is uh, is is once such opportunist instead of one such opportunist. A former business associate of Lee's daughter, the suit claims Oliveras. Uh, took control of Lee's professional and financial affairs and began enriching himself through various schemes and bogus enterprises. Within days of Jones' death, Oliveras and others fired Stanley's banker of 26 years and his longtime attorney and transferred $4.6 million out of Lee's account without authorization, uh, according to the lawsuit. So, um, let me see if there, oh, well, there is a link to a PDF that it looks like uh, a lawsuit. I'm looking for a date uh, filed by fax, Superior Court of the State of California, uh, plaintiff uh, Stan Lee individual uh, versus Gerardo Olivares, an individual 99 oh 999 doheny llc account blah 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 so uh this looks like it might be fairly legit april 13th 2018 is the date so, so uh you know that's pretty interesting under the pretext of checking on lee's well-being olivera's convinced a grieving man to sign over power of attorney and appoint olivera's own lawyer yuri Litzak as okay so um he duped Lee into uh, donating $300,000 to a bogus charity, and uh, he misled Lee in several ways. Um, so, okay, let's see. what I want to see what about the blood was. Uh, in a particular ghoulish money-making scheme, Oliveras instructed a nurse to extract many containers of blood from Lee, which Hands of Respect later sold in Las Vegas for thousands of dollars. The suit contends. There are shops in Las Vegas selling Lee's, Stanley's blood said a family friend Kia Morgan they're stamping his blood inside the Black Panther comic books and they sell them for $500 each wow um so there you go so I uh, you know I'll have to uh, see if this is true or not uh, several as I said the yet several other sites have picked up something else similar how much of what these other articles are is just a rewrite of the thing from deadline I, I don't know um but i really hope it's um i hope it if if the this pdf is is really of a lawsuit and these people really did these things to stan lee i really hope they get what's coming to him although you know he is 95 and uh you know he may die before this uh, all gets all cleared up yeah um I mean, I really hope that, well, to an extent, I really hope that these claims aren't true. There's just, there's three groups that you never like hearing are ever being abused, whether, and we're, we're talking about abuse in general, we're not getting into the specifics. We never like hearing about abuse towards children, the elderly, and especially small animals. So whenever you hear that one of those groups is targeted, it almost kind of causes a... I really can't figure out the exact words that I want to use here, but it just like it's like a punch to the gut. Like you feel it deep down inside you, and it really stings, even though it might not be personally affecting you. Mostly because all of us will have somebody along those lines that we are attached to. Uh, Stan Lee's case, I mean, 95 years. Uh, I've had um, we have a, uh, I think my grandmother is somewhere around that age range. So to hear that. He's been a victim of some type of abuse, of any kind of abuse. That's uh, gut wrenching. But wasn't there something in the beginning about how these claims weren't true, and all of a sudden, in the span of just what was it, a couple of days, it turned out to be true? Well, that's part of you know. I don't know, um, you know, the the article in the deadline. I mean, that could be a rewrite of an article from the day before. 
And when I was reading through several of these articles, uh, in fact, Gizmodo and the AV Club look like they're on the same site. So I don't know how much of it's just repeating other information. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, this PDF of, of a lawsuit, I mean, this filing looks legitimate. This is what filings look like in court. Now, whether this is real or someone's taken an old one and doctored it, I don't know. Um, there's a stamp at the top for the for the time and date, and it's a little bit hard to read. And then someone's written in there in, in blue ink because uh, um, it has APR very clearly when it says 13, 2018. And then an initial, um, it's filed by fax. Uh, it's stamped uh, Sherry R. Carter, executive officer, clerk. Uh, right. By Donita Fowler, deputy, uh, you know, Superior Court of California. I you can fake these, but um, you know, if this, as I say, if this is true and and people really did this, I mean, this is case number SC one two nine one two seven. No summons issued. Uh, basically, the complaint is conversion, fraud, financial abuse of elder. Uh, California Welfare and Institutions Code Section 15610.30 Misappropriation of Name and Likeness name under, and likeness under and we're Echoing, echoing. Mm -hmm. California Civil yep. Code Section 3344 Common Law Misappropriation of Name and Likeness and Demand of Accounting So there's six uh, complaints here and, they, and there's a demand for a, a jury trial So we will see if this continues. Then we'll know that uh, it's you know it's cooperating. It doesn't get signed. I mean, it's signed. Jonathan B. Freud, uh, Craig A. Huber, attorneys for plaintiff Stanley. So, yeah, definitely we will see. Um, uh, like right now. I mean, it, this is like really such a touchy subject because it's not even because it's an issue of elder abuse to me. It's more about just imagine everything we've been in the last couple of years, especially not uh, just with entertainment and the cultural shift and sensitivity, you know, being the way that it is nowadays. Uh, you know, when I, re I remember when we were talking, um, I don't know if it was in an early episode of the fan cast. But we used to meant we talked about um you know like our heroes from the past you know our heroes from growing up you know they're dying one by one or they're getting old and moving on or whatever stan lee you know was he is, isn't it while he himself wasn't the superhero he was the guy well one of the guys not the main guy but one of the guys that gave rise to the modern day hero you know the whole uh, the virtuoso, the guy that takes one for the team, the guy that defends his teammates, the guy that stands up for that so on and so forth, right? Right. So here that th this is that this may be potentially the way he goes. I think it's probably was the most upsetting part for me. Uh, it's you know in the era right now where people need to have more hope, um, a little more faith in themselves and in the world, and have people to look up to, not just people who are being. Put into the spotlight, or characters that are put into the spotlight, just to appeal to an identity, but have someone of ideals, or someone to at least present those ideals out there to the people, and tell them to be inspired, be like your heroes, uh, look up to them, or or try to emulate them at best. To hear that this is how you go, it, it, can you imagine if Stanley's life was written as a comic book? This would be like the final chapter for him. Right. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he, he could easily die before this court case even goes very far. You know. I don't know. It's like I wouldn't even want to read the end of that chapter. Right. Understood. Yeah, uh, it's a very touchy subject, uh, elder abuse. That's why I said there's like three groups for me definitely that I can I would I can never like say much more than what I can. Uh, I hopefully down the I mean. Part of me wishes this, this is just a mention. He's just saying things, but then that wouldn't be that good either, because you know he should right. be making claims, and that's just clear signs of dementia. That's just showing mental deterioration. You wouldn't want that either. It doesn't look good either way. That's I, I just don't know what else to think at this moment. I'm just hoping that if and indeed there is some form of abuse, that these individuals do see a day in court, and hopefully the justice is served. But what is Stanley going to do now at 95, actually? Right. 
Well, and that's I, I've one of somebody you know brought that up too is that uh, you know apparently there's been reports that he's had to have been helped to sign his own name. He kind of forgets where he is. I mean, I remember my grandfather. My grandfather died about uh, Stanley's age. Uh, he was. He was almost 97. He was about 96 and a half. And there were times he was very, you know, very um, with it and knew where he was. And other times he'd be a little confused. Now, he, you know, he stopped driving when he was in his 80s. He had cataracts and different things. But, um, you know, it, it's it, it obviously it happens deterioration with age and stuff like that. So there is some of that. Uh, and to me, yeah, I, I have to agree. These are kind of the lowest forms of, of criminals are ones who take advantages of, you know, kids and as well as older people. You know, you have the, the scammers who, you know, they don't necessarily know that they're scamming an old person. But, you know, the the infamous, you know, um, the, the Nigerian prince scam and all that other stuff. I mean, yeah, those are big ones, especially yeah. for the elderly. Yeah. It's like, you know, that just really is, um, really sucks that people are like that. So, well, well so it's a kind of like not making such a depressing subject to talk about. South Park did an episode like that one time where, um, one of the characters, Stan, I believe, his grandfather was getting, it, it was like that, um, I think it was like that cash for gold scam or something about, um, buying jewelry, right? Mm hmm. And what happened was that his grandfather bought him some kind of gay-looking necklace, as, as he put it. But, you know, he appreciated it because it was his grandfather. But what he didn't like was the fact that it was not only his grandfather, but other elderly people were being taken advantage of by these infomercials to tell them, like, sell your stuff or something. I don't remember too well what it was that they were trying to sell. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more towards cash for gold, but I could be wrong. And um, what happened was that the kids were like, you guys are running a scam. Like, uh, like, you, do you understand? Like, these are elderly people. Like, they barely, some of them barely even know where they're at. Right. You know, they, they hammered the point home. But what happened was that the kids went to confront this guy and they told him, you know, you should just kill yourself. Like, kill yourself. Like, you really are that bad of a human being. Just go ahead and kill yourself. And, you know, we've always heard kids tell, you know, adults or other people that. But what's hilarious is that later in the episode, I think it's after the credits, you see that the guy's still on TV trying to pass the same scam and he's taking callers. And it's the same elderly people that he was scamming and they're all calling him like, young man, you should just kill yourself. Do it like you. Kind of like some poetic justice. All right. Yeah. So, man, it really is such a hard subject to talk about, man. It's, it's, it's very um, depressing just to think about that. Yeah, it is, and uh, we'll, we'll 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 you know obviously we'll keep a our pulse on it, see what happens, and um, if these people really did this, I really hope they uh, burn for it. Yeah, I I would agree. So all right, so let's stay on the the morbid theme we've got going here. So uh, the other thing that I've I've just within the last hour heard about, apparently this happened today, but Art Bell. King of late night conspiracy radio has died. He Are was, you for real? I am for real. He was seventy two. Um, Colin showed we coast to coast AM. Lizard. Go ahead. What? Wasn't the lizard people right? I don't know. Um, so the legendary late night radio host who spent decades at the helm of his massively popular interview and Colin show coast to coast AM. Calmly, calmly listening and questioning as his guests and callers outlined every damn conspiracy theory, ally, alien abduction idea, and off-the-wall opinion that happened to come across their minds was 72. So, uh, yeah. And sometimes I, you know, at, apparently his, uh, regard, his own beliefs were reportedly a sort of skeptical libertarianism. Um, Bill understood what there was good radio and letting these elaborate ideas play out. Which one thing I liked about that? Since the whole the whole idea of freedom of expression and, and and exchanging of ideas, I know we you know we make fun of flat earthers and others, but many times instead of you know suppressing these ideas, if you let them play out, they will eventually go by the wayside. You know. Well, the, not you mentioning the flat Earth thing. Just as a as a quick aside. I probably will be taking up a project soon to try to, just for the hell of it, um, prove prove it true. 
I don't believe at all that the Earth is flat, but for the hell of it, I'll try to prove it true. If there is, <laughs> you know what it, you know what it is is the whole debate. Like you can be a really, you know, you're a really good debater if you can argue the opposing side. Uh huh. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and argue for flat earthers. So you flat earthers, you have a, you have your unlikely supporter here for like God knows how many more weeks going forward. I'm gonna try to prove you people right, and uh, and if I can't, then we know this is a load of bullshit. So uh, I'll keep you guys posted on how that happens. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I used to listen to that show um, here and there every now and then. Um, and I, I think I believe there was like that infamous um, hijacking episode one where with a guy, mysterious guy called the AM Radio, and it was something about working at Area Fifty One. I don't know if you ever heard of that one. No. I don't think so. Maybe I, I don't know. I'm gonna look it up and see if I can find it. Maybe I'm hoping it, I, I'm hoping it is the same one Barkdale, but it has to be him because it was the post um, post radio thing. But um, talking about the exchange of ideas and let them play out. I mean, there's a lot of things that sound absurd um, when you really sit down and think about it. The idea of aliens, uh, little green men, big gray men, purple men, gay men, whatever, right? It's it, it sounds weird. It sounds ridiculous. Uh, shapeshifters, the paranormal, Lucky Charms, I don't care. It's It all sounds absurd when you really sit down and think about it because nobody's actually proven any of this. No one has had definitive 100% proof that any of this stuff exists. And yet, when you want to talk about theater, it is like the most entertaining thing out there. You know, of course, it's making you know the flat earth conspiracy theory sounds like a lot of bull. And it really does, especially some of the reasons why they used to justify it. But you can't help but get a good laugh at it. Like, imagine if you were to suppress this speech, right? Mm-hmm. Think, where would the entertainment be? <laughs> yeah, well, there's that too. Like, honestly, you're right. This, this is the beauty of um, this is the beauty of free speech that it cuts both ways. It's used to defend you, protect your rights, and as well as protect the freedom of speech of others. And in, slur- and, in, and in so, you have the exchange of ideas. Sometimes they're going to be good ideas. Sometimes they're going to be absurd ideas. And sometimes they're going to be terrible ideas. Terrible ideas can include anything that is done by, I don't know, something that rhymes with um, Wisney. Um, just, just to point out a dumb idea. But other times it could just be entertainment ideas, like the idea of somebody on a radio talking about aliens and moon men and all that other crap. You know, I like listening a lot to that stuff, especially on YouTube, and I've always found it to be very fascinating. And if you don't take it at face value, when you take it at kind of a level of enter- as entertainment, it is it is quite, I will tell you this much, I've enjoyed it as easy listening. It's almost like the equivalent, I would say, of putting on um, easy listening music on the radio, right. like elevator music, and just sitting back and just relax it for a bit. And uh, other times, they can be a bit of an eye-opener. If you really think about it, yeah, no, it, I I've listened to it a few times, um, especially when years ago when I was working really ridiculous hours and I'd be driving home uh, pretty late or, or maybe on ski patrol or something. But and there were times that the, some of the discussions were very good. I mean, you had people who had done a lot of research on maybe uh, you know uh, perhaps lost civilizations and things like that. I don't really believe the the full story of what we're told in, in history class. I mean, there's heck, there's things in science class that you're you're told that are very contradictory uh, with one another, and most things are theoretical uh, and they're not presented that way. And uh, you, you know, you can't you know some things. If they say, well, this takes too long to do or whatever, you can't do an experiment. Well, then it's not really science; it's just kind of a belief. And uh, you know, but sometimes, yeah, there were some real crackpots on that show, and uh, I think that was that's part of what that article was talking about. You know, Art Bell saw that it was good radio, whether he believed the person or not, um, was less material to can he engage this person for however long. You know, I think that show was on for three hours at night. Uh, I don't know if he had the same guests all the time, and many of the ones that I've actually heard are on YouTube that people will record and put them on YouTube and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if you've got some crazy nut, 
you know, what most people think someone's crazy who's going to talk about flying saucers going in and out of the Bermuda Triangle and and the evidence and stuff like that. And if you can have a an engaging conversation, entertainment for three hours, that is the uh, the essence of a good host. And and that's part of what you know I liked Art Bell. I mean, you know, uh, respected his abilities in, in many ways. It's like Howard Stern. Howard Stern's show, I mean, I when I was younger, I, I got into his shtick a little bit, and then it was like, you know, this is just silly. But I've heard from many professionals in radio and television that Howard Stern is one of the best interviewers around. Oh, and, yeah, he is. And how he kind of makes people relax. He gets people to admit things that, not to admit something they've not done, but they get relaxed and open up to him uh, more than they will others. And uh, that is, I think it's a skill and an art, it, you know, it's obviously something you can learn, but I think there's an innateness about that, that you can put someone at ease. And, you know, Art Bell seemed to be in a category where he could make, um, you know, gold out of, of crap. And uh, it's kind of sad to see him go. But, uh, you know, and I don't know what his health stuff was. It doesn't get a whole lot into the article. I mean, I don't, really don't follow the man's career. So I know he, 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 I think he gave up Coast to Coast a while ago. And he's had other people run it. But, um, so uh, there we go. 72 years old. Uh, may he broadcast forever in the next realm. Well, just want to say one last thing before. Uh, um, well, I don't have a beer to drink to the poor guy, but... Um, Next time, Mark Bell, if I'm at a bar, I'm um, lamenting over an ex or something like that. I'll be sure to drink one for you, buddy. But um, if you think about it, you know, you're talking about Howard Stern, you know, and like the art that he had to calm people down, but how to be a great interview and let people just talk. Uh, this whole idea of making radio, because for people like Stern, Stern has always been about mostly the radio aspect of it. You know, no visuals, just audio. We hear the side of the story. We ourselves in our minds, uh, we fill in the we 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 draw the, our images, those images in our head, right? That's that's the thing kind of liked about um the whole coast to coast radio, um and if you think about it, the whole like conspiracy radio theory thing, for better or for worse, has inspired other people to do this kind of level of infotainment, if you will. Hell, if you know where I'm going with this, uh, we could almost even say, at least I would make this argument that we wouldn't have the entertainment value that is Alex Jones today if it wasn't for people like Art Bell. No, I agree. I, I think both Art Bell and, Art Bell and uh, Howard Stern, um, they kind of pushed the limits in different ways. You know, Howard kind of went up against the FCC uh, a lot. Uh, you know, you can put, if you're going to kind of p see people who pushed the envelope or did things a little bit differently and went against the grain, as it were, um, you know, Rush Limbaugh would go in that category too. I remember in the '90s when when his radio show was becoming more and more popular, and you know there were talks of bringing back the fairness doctrine and uh, and equal time and all this other stuff. And you, you know, people complained that he didn't have the other side. And it's like, and what was funny is that you've not listened to his show because he plays the other side first. Um, but that whole pioneering attitude that you couldn't take a talk show. I mean, AM radio was just about dead before Limbaugh came around and um, what a you, know, you know Stern was on FM uh, but he he you know I forget when he went from DC to New York I think it was in the 80s at some point but it was around the same time Limbaugh was start I believe starting to kind of go national and um, you know whether you agreed with these people or not of what they do I mean obviously these are very different topics very different styles what they cover and everything else but they pushed the limits. They pushed the boundaries quite a bit in many different directions. Uh, they gave us more entertainment in radio. They they breathed life into radio. I remember when, you know, Jim Cramer was on radio, and then he decided that that you know radio was dead, and he went to like MSNBC or whatever. You know, <laughs> he doesn't have as big an audience as he used to. I mean, Howard Stern jumped ship and went to XM. Now, a lot of why he did that was. Um, really to get away from the restrictions of that he, yeah. he, he just wanted to, and it wasn't just because they wanted to be able to drop f-bombs every five seconds in fact he admonished his staff when they were doing that it's like look that's you're just doing it to do it now but to have the freedom that if it happens they don't have to worry about getting dumped or emptied or bleeped or whatever so 
that makes a, a big difference. And, uh, you know, Art Bell, obviously, his controversial topics weren't due to the language of the user or his necessarily his political beliefs, but it really was about the the topics of discussion, you know, the kind of the weird and fringe, but good grief, you know, some of these fringe ideas have made their way into mainstream. And um, there's more and more belief. I talked about, you know, lost civilizations before. There's more and more uh, that kind of that next generation of archaeologists are starting to say, you know, we don't have the whole picture. And if there was a civilization 10, 15,000 years ago, uh, maybe during the last ice age, and it was along the coast and different things, and now the, the, the sea is more than 300 feet higher than it was because of all of the ice that was on the land masses, especially in the north. You know, ice ages and all of those things, too, that no one has an explanation for. Uh, how do you, and most of the, of the glaciers were in North America. In Siberia and other places, you had very little glaciation. And no one, there's a bunch of theories why, but no one really knows. And when you get a cooling earth, the biggest problem is the snowfall. Because now you don't have enough energy to evaporate the water, to move it to cold area, to have larger snowfalls than normal. Or, or you, know, to, uh, you know, to build the glaciers over thousands of years. And so now it's, okay, could the glaciers actually form a lot faster you know, uh, there's there's evidence that the North American ice sheet got hit by asteroids or something. I know there's there's um, shock has his solar flare theory, but there's definitely something that happened in the solar system that basically got these things to melt in days, not five thousand years. But you know, when they look at the ice cores and they look, they get the they extract the temperatures, they see these huge spikes up and down over a handful of years, not. You know, we're talking a dozen or less, and no one's sure exactly what causes that. And so, but in many ways, that was spurred on by people who had these crazy ideas that maybe there was something going on. And then we dig a little deeper, or we people go in and look at things, and hey, hey, wait a minute, we've got a correlation here. We've got some craziness going on that we're not sure what it is. You know, it was Clovis was the earliest spear points in america and then there's pre-clovis so yeah you're probably going to hear some you know really off the wall things on coast to coast that'll never be mainstream but there are also some ideas that you're going to hear that um are it's kind of like michael savage is another one that people you know his background is in is in herbology and in his doctorate his doctoral thesis he actually studied herbs and medicines of multiple cultures around the world mm. and he knows from a chemical standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, how much some of these work and some of them are bogus. And of course, the ones that work, the, the uh, pharmaceutical companies don't want people knowing about because if you can grow a remedy for something in your backyard, you don't have to go spend 30 bucks at, at the grocery store to buy their chemical crap. So, so you can talk about conspiracy, you know, conspiracy, conspiracy theory has that, that really negative connotation, but many times it's, it's, it's true. And I agree. We wouldn't have people like Alex Jones without some of these uh, earlier pioneers or we, they'd be around, but they'd be like on shortwave or something like they used to be and talking to one another. And, uh, but I, you know, go back and look in the nineties. The, the, I mean, the hate speech stuff we're dealing with now is nothing like, well, in, in many ways, I guess it's an offshoot, but you know, you had, um, and even in the early 2000s, I forget what year, but the Democrat, I, I don't know if it was the Democrats in Congress voted to censure Rush Limbaugh in cinema. You know, it, it didn't ha have any teeth in it, but these are the same kind of people that are harping over so-called hate speech now and, and, uh, you know, the same mentality that is shutting people down and getting Laura's, Lauren Southern um, booted out of Britain. There's there's the origins of it. Huh? That happened? Yeah, last week or the week before. She Holy was shit. she was in Calais. She was going from France to England, and they denied her access. She was supposed to appear uh, somewhere, I forget what, and then... Um, 
You also had uh, Sargon of Akkad was at, he was actually it was at a forum with people who disagreed with him on certain s things and some things they agreed. It was he's more of a, of a classic liberal. There were some conservatives. There were some other people, and uh, you had these Antifa show up. And um, this one guy and I don't know if you you know it's a great video to watch, but this guy tries to kind of push Sargon aside. And he just kind of, he kind of pushes back a little bit, ends up stealing the guy's flag. Um, you know, his Antifa flag, which is why he now shows up in some of his videos behind him, especially when he's talking to Paul Joseph Watson. And the funniest thing about that, I think it was King's College, but the funniest thing about that whole video is when security guys show up, there's these big black guys that show up, there was security who are forcing these whiny, <laughs> pasty-faced, you know, Antifa white people out, and they're yelling and calling them Nazis and fascists and stuff. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it, the look on their face is like, really? <laughs> but, um, just to just to add something to what you just said. First of all, I don't care what anybody's opinions are on Lauren, Lauren Southern. Lauren Southern is a fucking goddess and has this thread of uh, journalistic integrity, at least. God damn, how are you people going to deny her access to your country? Let her in. Have you seen how smoking that woman is? Jesus. Yeah. Oh, and also, she. If I don't know if this is gonna sound weird to you, but that'd probably be one of the few men in the world that I would ever consider consider sleeping with. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking Some about. Some of you understood why he said that. Absolutely. Thank uh, you, listeners. That is that. I will leave that as a uh, as an exercise. But if you Google that, you'll um, you'll understand exactly what he's talking about. But uh, yes, in Canada. So. Uh, Understand, and you will see just the point that was made. This is why people respect Lawrence Southern, and you will understand. Um, Sargon, well, Sargon for me has kind of fallen off a bit. I, I don't know, he's doing some weird stuff now, but I will say this much. Regardless of whether I may have started disagreeing with him lately, he does, like you say, have a lot of that classical liberal approach, and he really, there really should be no reason why anybody should be trying to shut us down, whatever he has to say. I'm not gonna just because I don't agree with the guy on certain things anymore doesn't mean let's shut him down. Right. But um. But you know it's it's talking about the 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 white pasty face kid that uh challenges this big black guy about fascist and everything like that. Well, you'd be amazed. Uh, you know, I've I've worked in position. I won't say I've had positions of power and jobs before, but I've worked very close with people who had power. And, you know, one of the things that they do, especially in the very, you know, high upper positions with the lower guy, you know, with the in-between guys is that they will have the in-between guys enforce the rules for them. You know, like they don't want to deal with like the people at the bottom. They're not going to deal with them unless it's absolutely necessary. So they'll send one of us to go down. Now me being as Mexican as I could possibly appear, talking to other Latinos, hearing other Latinos to, uh, say to my face, oh, you're just discriminating me, man. You're in your mind like, are we are we like having this conversation? Like, do you understand what you're saying? You're saying to another Latino that he is discriminating. One that looks shades darker than you, looks like he came here on a burro and a poncho and a sombrero, with possibly a few tattoos of the Virgin Mary on the side of. I don't know. Just saying, like, I look like one of them people. You're claiming that I'm discriminating you. It sounds absurd, but it's true. This is what people think when they just want to justify their beliefs. They will toss out words like discrimination. They'll toss, what is it now? I think like they said, they'll toss anything your way. They'll call you racist, fascist, almost anything in the book, right? Not necessarily profanity or an insult, but just anything, just so that they can silence your voice. Right. So, no, I'm not surprised. That is actually very hilarious to hear. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, again, it, it's that the, the free form and discussion of ideas is how. Good ideas get implemented and bad ideas go away. Uh, the worst thing you can do is suppress a bad idea because then people want to know, well, why are they suppressing them? This is, I think this is how communism became so popular because we, we, it was a horrible idea. It was repressed and it became, um, you know, uh, kind of forbidden to talk about. And so that's what made it become popular in many ways. Now, And some of it now is people just are uneducated 
and mm-hmm. or or they ha- they think they're educated, but they only have a one sided education about some support of that stuff. And this is why now we're getting the suppression of freedom and liberty and personal choice and responsibility. Those are all crazy ideas. And then in Europe, and we do a little bit here, but more so in Europe. They're letting these Islamo fascists, actual fascists, actual uh, patriarchy mindset into various countries, and it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, I I know why they're doing it. I know I understand that. It's but it's just crazy. But um, anyway, so let me go on to my next topic. So I have from Variety.com. Uh, that was something. just the statement. Yeah, a quiet place, which is a movie apparently that I've never heard of. To lead box office, Rampage debuts at $32 million. So this is from today, the 14th of April. Uh, obviously, this is kind of a projection based on Thursday and Friday uh, and part of Saturday ticket sales. But thanks to strong word of mouth, uh, John Krasinski's horror film, A Quiet Place, is looking to top the box office for the second weekend in a row with $34 million. Uh, from 3,589 domestic locations. Just behind the South by Southwest success story is Warner Brothers New Lines Rampage with 32 million with 4,101 sites. Uh, Friday, Friday's estimate had adjusted the Dwayne Johnson starred debut to be 27 to 32 million range with earlier tracking, forecasting, and opening between 35 and 40. Well, you know, it's close, I guess. Uh, I don't think Rampage is going to get anywhere close to Jumanji numbers uh, long term. I think I still think that part of Jumanji's success was because of the horrible The Last Jedi. Um, apparently, Emily Blunt also stars in the Quiet Place thriller. Uh, a Quiet Place takes uh, Mark. The Quiet Place take marks a strong hold. See, this is horrible. A Quiet Place's take marks a strong hold after. De- debuting at 50 million last weekend with a 30% drop. So the Paramount film earned 10 and a half million on its second week, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how much it costs. Um, so anyway, it looks like, uh, it's, uh, da, 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 uh, Rampage is $120 million budget. Um, and then we have truth or dare. Third place spot is another horror title, Blumhouse's Truth or Dare, with 19 million. Um, apparently, this has critics have not loved this film, and it currently sits at 19 percent on Rotten Tomatoes with a B minus. But uh, you know, three and a half million dollar budget, and you bring in 19 million, that ain't bad. So let's uh, just just for giggles, uh, let's see what audiences say about uh, that. And apparently, Ready Player One is uh 24.6 so now though they don't list they don't have rampage on here at all yet well maybe this is last, week. this is 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 last week's numbers yeah oh this is last week's numbers well yeah i don't think i don't think rotten tomatoes updates their thing until monday um it would be nice if i put a date on it well that because yeah quiet place 50 million 50.1 million uh, 0.2 million that was la- that, that article said it was last week's so rotten tomatoes truth or dare is 15 percent uh for the professional and 19 percent for the audience score so that's not good but apparently if you know i mean 19 million dollars so even if we say three and a half million so it's you know total cost of million that's 12 million in its first weekend and and possible profit so I'm Ready Player asking. One, yeah. nabbed fourth. Uh, I still haven't seen that movie. I've been told by multiple people. Um, I really should have read the book a couple of years ago. Uh, apparently, uh, 573 theaters dropped it from last weekend, so that does not bode well. Well, it may be part of the problem for that movie. Listen, it's, it's not a bad movie. The, I know I bashed it a little bit, and rightfully so. I think it deserves some, like, you know, a little criticism, you know, a few, a few shots here and there. But it's not a bad movie, but it's just so much about it that could have been, in my opinion, a great movie. Like, it just feels like it just hits the, like, you're you're a solid B movie at best, but you could have been an A movie if, right. if, you do, if you did things a little differently. I don't know exactly what they could have done to make it better. Maybe this was just what they figured was the best. But to me, it's I think a lot of it is that from what I'm understanding, because I've even read some reviews on Amazon of, of Ready Player One, so again, I can only 
take people's um, whatever I read at face value for the most part is that they feel like it's just pop culture reference after pop culture reference after pop culture reference like basically it's just tugging on nostalgia and you know there's actually been another series that I bel- that I have been making fun of that seems to do a similar thing where all they ever do is just reference pop culture and that seems to be like their whole shtick after a while um, I don't know about you but uh, every time I talk about that series I-, I just I just get this unnatural desire to, 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 to buy some sauce or something oh, god like that sweet tangy um what, what kind of sauce was that I, I, I can't remember I gotta go to McDonald's I'll be back <laughs> yeah the, the sauce that will remain unnamed so anyway uh, but that's a you know that's a pretty nice weekend uh, rampage is I, I just I I don't know I don't I don't know if there's ever been a really good video a video game to um, I mean there's a couple uh, what's well what's mortal the first mortal Kombat wasn't too bad no it wasn't um, I think if anything let, let's I'll, I'll give you an, an opinion of what I think were good video game movies but I'm gonna distinguish something to, to kind of I guess put my reasoning out there I don't know Mortal Kombat was a good adaptation in my opinion. I don't think it was too crazy. It wasn't that bad. The second There's one only was so horrible. much you can do. Right. Huh? The second one the was sequel, horrible. Yeah. Terrible. Sequel makes the first one look like a masterpiece and rightfully so. Thank you for the sequel. That much we I can appreciate. Um, other adaptations of movies that were based on video games that weren't any good. I don't know. Uh, looking back on it, I did try rewatching Tomb Raider and I just thought about it. I'm like, damn. I think the only reason I ever watched this was because Angelina Jolie back then was hot, and that was it. Other than that, this movie has no substance. Yeah. Um, well, the, see, again, that was one where the first one wasn't bad, but the second yeah. one was horrible, and it made the first one yeah. look better. I mean, the second one was just stupid. I, and part of the problem with the second one is is because of the popularity of the first one, I think they rushed that one, didn't take their time, and it really, really showed. It, it really did. Um, I'm trying to think. Are there any other movies uh, based on video games that were um, any good? And it's really... And again, we're talking about adaptations. Right. It's yeah, because really more like Tron was a movie first and it had a yeah. game tie-in. It wasn't like there was an arcade game for years and then they made made a movie. Um, Tron you know, is a good... I mean, well, people said Tron is good. Uh, I know you have your opinions on it. Oh, I like so, it. I mean, I loved it as, as a... Uh, however old I was when I saw it 14, 15 years old whenever year it came out and then I liked the um, legacy too but um, uh, you know but your, your Mario Brothers was horrible um, oh god no I was going to talk about that the other one was it Street Fighter I think was another one that was I think it was Street Fighter yeah there was a Street Fighter movie was, we don't talk about that, that either it was horrible Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles again that was a comic I mean, it was a yeah. video game. Eventually, you know that that one, the first one was good. The second one wasn't too bad, but by the third one, it was just getting too corny. Uh, and I, I don't know. speak about the reboot. The reboots don't exist in my room. That was a reboot. Yeah, with Megan Fox or whatever the heck her name is. Oh God, you were supposed to play along. Oh, I'm sorry. No, there wasn't a reboot. I just I just that was just a dream. Too late. I'll go back to Megan Fox or something. Oh God, I can't believe I just said that on the air. Yeah. Ugh, just don't I rub the makeup it. off. But uh, you know, again, it's a, it, it's tough to do the form. I mean, it's easy to do a comic book uh, type. Uh, you know, things can happen in games that are harder to do in real life as well as in comics, and that's why sometimes the adaptations to the screen aren't as good as it could be. So anyway. yeah. Well, I'll give you an example of what I thought were good video game movies. And notice that if you, you'll start to notice um, a trend here. I will definitely say Ready Player One makes the cut. Um, it's not terrible. I, I know I bash it a lot, but it really isn't terrible. It really does deserve at least a little bit of praise of what it tries to do and what it does right. Visually, it is at times stunning. Um, they're very great. Um, towards the end, the action picks up. 
Those are are there little things like mixed messages here and there that I don't understand what the movie's trying to get at? Yes. Is there is is there a lot of cringe in it? Believe me, if I have to see another LARPing scene again in the movie, I am done. I probably may just walk out at that point. It's just so funny. It it doesn't deserve to be in that film. Um, but just to give you a note, yes, it, it is a good movie. Um, another movie that I will say was pretty solid as a video game movie. Um, surprisingly, this is one of the few times Disney made a smart choice or did a decent story. It was uh, Wreck-It Ralph. I really enjoyed that movie. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Although that was a cartoon. No, was that really a game first? No. Here's the thing about Wreck-It Ralph. The whole marketing of that game, of that game, of that movie, was based on a game that they put out to seem convincing as possible. Like, they, they held it as a lost game. Oh, okay. And that was the whole marketing behind it. So that was real cleverly. That was like marketing wise. That was cleverly done. Yeah. And the movie itself, for the most part, is just an enjoyable family flick. Yeah. It's a very good yeah. movie. Um, they make a. They, there's cameos in it too. Like there's references to other video games. There's cameos like M. Bison in it, Zangief, uh, Bowser, Doctor Eggman, Ross Slash, Robotnik, whatever you want to call them, Sonic. Like, they make little references to video games here and there. Um, like, people who are gamers will pick up on them, or people that know of these games will pick on them. But they don't, you know, they don't become the movie. You know, they don't they don't try to make that the focus in the movie. Uh, the story is pretty straightforward linear. You know, good uh, bad guy who plays a bad guy doesn't want to play the bad guy anymore. He wants to be the good guy. But realizes, you know, towards the end that that doesn't necessarily make up who he is. It's a very fun story. Yeah. For anybody who says Disney is trash, yes, I agree. For the most part, they are, but occasionally they do get one right. This is one of those. Um, another one, people shit on me for this one. I like it. I know a lot of people, uh, my brothers, my nephews enjoy it. I enjoy it. And speaking of which, we might want to just do this one real quick to transition to another topic. Um, pixels. Oh. The Adam that Sony did. Yeah. I know people hate it, but hear me out. Go ahead. Visually, in terms of a movie where it blends reality and fantasy, I think that's where they got it right. Because it looks like they're literally playing within, like they're people within a video game. Like the game is around them. Right. It's a life or death thing at points. And you actually feel like there's a level of suspense in the movie. Could have the movie been a lot better? Yes. Does it have some enjoyable moments? Absolutely. Peter Dinklage as a fake Billy Mitchell. <laughs> yes, I didn't realize it until only like in the last couple months that he was actually a joke. He was actually made as purposely that design, that actor and everything was purposely done. Even the way he acted, like so cocky and everything, go the fire blaster. And, it's, and, you know, when he makes mocks all Adam Sandler's character, it's like, where Adam Sandler's like, I could beat you at any game, you name it. And he's like, well, there's one game I know you can't beat me at. <laughs> Starting to sound familiar, ladies and gentlemen. Start, especially at the end where they revealed, hey, guess what? He cheated. You were the champion this whole time. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, that's actually, it's funny you say that because I do have an article pulled up here. Uh, King of Kong's Billy Mitchell has been stripped of all his high scores banned from competitive gaming. Um, it now, just called it. Yep, uh, you kind of read my mind, and I didn't discuss this one earlier either. So this was not planned, but uh, yeah, apparently it's on the King Kong. I, I don't think anybody's disputing his Pac-Man prowess. Um, I mean, I've seen him do stuff on live. I mean, with the, the, the guy who invented Pac-Man, where he has to do a maneuver in less than one sixtieth of a second. And then he got, basically goes through ghosts because they're not looking at him. And if, if they're not looking at Pac-Man, they don't kill him. Um, and that's the refresh rate of the screen. So that's why he has one sixtieth of a second to, to make that. And uh, But apparently he was using uh, an emulator to uh, his... Basically, he set a record. I think he set a record on a live machine. And while they were filming a documentary about it, I guess this was 2007, uh, someone beat his high score. And I really think he let his um, ego get the best of him. 
I mean, he does kind of have that e egotistical attitude. I mean, he is very good player at games, but uh, apparently oh, someone, someone took apart his video and noticed that uh, the load screen, so this is a frame-by-frame, because -frame, he provided a, a VHS tape. And uh, it was just of a video capture. Usually, apparently, when people do video, they have the camera over them, you know, like over their shoulder, so you can see that they're playing yeah. on a cabinet. This was just the kind of the capture. Uh, but the loading sequence was identical to MAME. It was not identical to the actual game. So uh, he's been booted off Twin Galaxies. Apparently, he's also had some uh, affiliation with them for quite a while, maybe even provided... Um, some financial in incentives to him. Uh, some That's of his, on this. yeah. Well, and I think some. I, I was w watching something yesterday. Uh, some of his um, high scores were put in by uh, one of the officials who happened to be a friend of his. Who's, yeah, uh, he had a he had a lot of connections there. Basically, and uh, it's been speculated. I don't know if it's speculation or truth, but that uh, he was basically keeping them afloat too, with mon you know, basically being a financial backer for them. Right. Um, and and to me, this is just kind of goes to, you know, if you're going to hold world records like this, they really need to be done under controlled circumstances. So it needs to be a part of a competition or a demonstration, not someone just submitting a, a video. Uh, a lot of people use MAME and other emulators when they're making videos about games because it's much easier to do that, especially the older hardware. Some of the newer stuff you can run through HDMI cable or something and you can and record it a lot easier, but... Um, you know, I, you know, to me, this is, is, I, I, I don't know if they weren't filming a, a documentary at the time when his record got beat, uh, if it was later, he may have, you know, challenged the guy to a, a score to do it later. Um, but yeah, he's been kind of booted out. This guy's, you know, he was, if I remember correctly, wasn't he the first one to get to the, the kill screen on Pac-Man level 256? That I don't remember. I know it was supposed to be between him. I think what was the other guy's name? Steve Weeby and um, some other dude that later on. Uh, Steve Weeby would be official first million. Okay. Uh, there's another name in here where did I just saw it. Well, there's uh, some controversy. Well, there is also from what I understand, like that there's controversy and there's a conspiracy belief that Weeby apparently is um, not genuine on his claims as well. Um, yeah, right. Like, Robbie La La Lakeman is is the one who actually holds the record now. So yeah. So I mean, there's there's a lot of conspiracy overall with these world record runs, um, mostly because especially when the tech when these records were in play, technology could not keep up with. You know what the the, the videos that they were submitting. It's like nowadays we have we're so far advanced into it that now you can analyze the same video over and over and over again until you finally look what it, find what it is that you're looking for. You can even have programs that can detect, hey, look, if this has been edited, altered in any way, shape, or form. So I think for them, it w I think for Mitchell especially, it was this kind of thing like, oh, well, we'll never come back to bite me. Um, and I think people just, I'm not entirely sure why now of all times. Like, is it is it is it a technology thing? They just didn't detect it before? Or was it that nobody wanted to ever deal with it until recently yeah i don't know uh to me this is someone that you know it's almost when i look at the video part or parts of the video the guy did on it it's almost like this is a vendetta and this is where i'm i actually downvoted the original video where the guy did his analysis because that was the vibe i got it's like this guy is going to get taken down, uh, you know, destroy our heroes type of thing. Well, he's or his record's already been beat. I think it's already been beaten more than once. Uh, but they're not really close. Rob, this is this article says Robbie Lakeman has it, so he may have been the first to a million or the second to a million. I, I don't know, but um, yeah, first to a million, for official first million point record holder. But you know, and maybe I'm wrong about the guy's motivations. Maybe he was just trying to understand the gameplay and just notice something weird and then decided to do a, a in-depth analysis. Um, but you know, this well, is to me is like, uh, you know, finding out that, you know, someone did steroids or whatever, but. Oh no, not, oh, not Billy Mitchell. He, he would never do this sort of thing. So, but you know, I'm really kind of, 
I, I don't know no, what I, I don't know what to think about it. I really, you know, granted, in some ways, I could care less, but because you know, the guy, you know, he was he, he sold hot sauce. I mean, it wasn't like he was some big rock star that you're finding out. It's not like Millie Vanilli winning an, a, a an Academy an Academy a Grammy and then finding out that the whole thing was fake. I mean, this guy's no, got real. You know, this guy has real skills. And, um, you know, as far as I know, this may be the only time he actually recorded off of a, cause I bet you he did use MAME for, for practice. He's, he's more or less admitted that in some interviews, but this may have been the only time that he really did it for, um, you know, record keeping. I don't know. I mean, there's another video where they're supposedly taking a board out of, a, a, it's a Donkey Kong board. And then they supposedly put in a Donkey Kong junior board in the same machine uh and the guy says well and, and he even shows a picture of a donkey kong junior board and a donkey kong board and i there's only one area where you can tell the difference and it's the color of three chips one has white one has yellow and i'm like you're telling me in the entire run of both those boards that stayed consistent you know and even the guy making the complaint didn't continue on and show if the video showed them booting up donkey kong jr I mean, it starts with them with Donkey Kong, and they turn it off, and then they do that. You know, that it's not like there's a there's some kind of weird cut or something. And this is, you know, we're talking VHS quality tape. This is years ago, and uh, they open up the panel, they 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 pull it back, they put what they believe in, but then he stops it and doesn't show if it boots up. And I'm like, you know, if you're gonna stop it short like that too, I mean, you're you know, I don't know how much of it's vendetta. I mean, granted, this is just kind of my skepticism of someone else's motivation. But yeah, I don't understand why now it's been 10 years, 11 years, and this record has been beaten. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets beaten again and again, but as, as people get better, uh, Billy's, I think he's in his fifties. I thought he was close to my age. So surely his skills are less than someone 18, 19. I mean, you look at those, world you know competitions that ea he puts on and stuff most of them are young but hey even there some guys cheat you yeah, know that, I mean, they'll, you'll have things live computer. with millions of people watching and someone will get uh, you know banned for a hack um i actually kind of want to explore this idea of the possibility of what you're talking about this whole uh vendetta thing and the reason why i just i Kind of want to is because everybody has always been talking about the King of Kong and how it's been this good documentary and everything like that. Me, I've never watched it. I would say that's the first thing to say. So if I, well, I may have watched bits and clips here and there, but I've never actually watched it entirely, nor did I really care to. So I don't know. I may, I may have said I have in the past, but I should be really more frank. I haven't really watched it like that. But anyways, the point I wanted to make is that even then. Even in that thing, you can kind of tell there was more of a, if, if I'm to use a wrestling analogy, and excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, for talking about wrestling in the show for a brief minute, but it's only to, you know, you make a, some, uh, a comparison. If I'm to use some wrestling at, um, and wrestling analogy, it's like booking a match, like when they're writing a storyline and they're booking a match to reflect the storyline, like, hey, this guy is going to say, is going to come out here and talk about this, and then this guy is going to do this to this guy, and it's going to lead to this. And they're going to fight next week at this location and it's going to end like this so that the, they have a reason to fight for the next match. And it's kind of like this the theatrical aspect to the movie. Like, oh, hey, who's going to be the one to beat the record first? Who's going to be the one to get to that high score? But you always understand that competitions are also breeding grounds for all sorts of shady behavior. Because remember, at the end of the day, it's not about necessarily about who is the best one per se like who's the most skilled is about the one who gets to the title first it's about the one who has the recognition and the namesake because for all we know there probably is somewhere buddy out there who can even get a higher score than the highest score ever recorded in donkey kong ever but like you said there is no controlled environment there is no method for him to submit the video footage and say you know and have it validated as soon as that and you know how difficult it is to and especially in video games to gain to get the same score the same exact score that you scored last time more than once especially consecutively 
very difficult. A lot of people who do, like, I don't know if you ever watched these speed running videos, you know, the people like to complete these games in like the shortest amount of time possible. Do you think these guys get it done in one shot? No, they, they play hours. Sometimes they'll be playing the same game for weeks on end, failure after failure after fail attempt. And most of them, they do stream it on Twitch or something like that. So at least you can validate. Well, I can't even say that anymore because apparently there's some instances of uh, cheating even during live streams. Um, you know, use of emulators and stuff like that. You know, they know how to manipulate camera equipment. So I I have reason to believe, like, or rather, I won't say have reason to believe, but I could kind of see your point, like, that there might be a vendetta against Billy Mitchell. That much... I know from what I've seen, there was it was in a documentary, but apparently there are some people who did do some recordings talking about how they were, they hated Billy Mitchell, they didn't even like Weeby. Then there's some a lot of other people that apparently get a lot of hate from these um, players as well. So I, I want to rule out the possibility of a personal vendetta. Maybe this was just the one time that they actually had some evidence to get Mitchell on, and he could have been squeaky clean on every other attempt for all we know and this was just the only one that they got him on so i would say with regards to this it would be very interesting to see in the coming months or weeks or months if anything else comes out or if another person with another world record you know like a very um well-known world record now gets exposed afterwards. Because, you know, what was it? I forgot the name of the first guy, but he was another well-known player. He got hit for his uh, world record um, not that long ago. And then it's like almost immediately, Billy Mitchell was the next one on the chopping block. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a third one lined up after this Billy Mitchell th controversy is over. And probably by the looks of it, it pretty much looks like it's done now. Um, I could be wrong. But don't be surprised if another one comes up in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I you know, I wouldn't be surprised, and uh, you know again I don't understand why this is so long from the time of the incursion. I think a lot of it. I I I'm guessing this is just a guess that it's tied into the uh, it being um, you know the the first one to get over a million uh, points in um, in Donkey Kong. I think that's really what it all kind of comes down to. But, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I was never that good in any of those games, so I really don't care about, <laughs> I mean, I, I like to play Pac-Man. I could get to the third or fourth screen. I bought a book a long time ago that had a pattern that was decent, but, you uh, know, you know well, Don, well, I was better at Donkey Kong Jr. on my, um, uh, well, what did I have? My, not Sega. I guess it was, No. Into, uh, ColecoVision years ago but um, you know it is what it is I guess and I guess we'll we'll find out more maybe as time goes on but yeah I wouldn't be surprised if uh, I think that what the, really that the, the, what brought this open what opened the door was that Twin Galaxies not having you know allowing for videotape recordings and uh, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've actually seen watched videos on how people do speed runs and how they figured out how to. There's ways in, in Super Mario to uh, do things and, and get. Um, you know, you're basically taking the mechanics of the game and working it against itself uh, to get to to get through certain speeds to get certain things set up so that you can skip worlds uh, pretty far. And um, and yeah, most a lot of times they're using emulators to go over to find to to go over and over and over again because you can save and that was there was some controversy recently uh where someone had done a speed run i forget what game and um someone else took apart the video and figured out that they were doing they were saving and then going back and uh and picking up from a point either they died or they got to something too slowly and uh then that was that was a discussion is that legal Right? Is a speed run supposed to be start to finish, no blinking, uh, or is it legal to do that? So I think a lot of it depends on if you're doing emulators or if you're doing the real hardware. So well, we'll see. We'll see. All right. I do have one last piece of news. And uh, 
This is about the um, James the James Cameron led okay. reboot to Terminator because okay. apparently all he can do is Terminator and maybe um, what's that other uh, shoot what's that uh, that other movie he's got he's doing sequels to with the blue people. Mm. God, uh, I remember it back when I was with my ex. Um, it's only only one that's got brought in two billion dollars, or the first one to two billion. Avatar. Um, Damn it. Brought back powerful memories. But anyways, Gabriel Luna is new Terminator. Natalie Reyes and Diego Bonita also set to star in Tim Miller James Cameron Skydance reboot. Oh, this is Skydance reboot. I thought it was Terminator reboot. Yeah, it's Terminator. This is again from Deadline, and I don't. <laughs> I mean, for all I know, this could be I you know someone's the entertainment version of The Onion. Um, but uh, the search for a new Terminator to take over the first sanctioned Jim Cameron uh, reboot since the original is over. Director Tim Miller and producer Cameron have tapped Gabriel Luna uh, for the role. Luna is best known for starring as Robbie Reese, Ghost Rider on the ABC. Oh, he's the he's the, oh that's when I stopped watching Agents of Shield when they started doing the Ghost Rider stuff. And it was just like, oh, we, we've recast because, you know, too many white people in the movie, in the series. Yeah, I'm pretty much done here. I don't even need to read the rest of it. But this looks like an SJW reboot of Terminator. Why? Diversity. Why? I, I, I don't... Uh, I'm going to just say this. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pretty sure you've already... I've made enough Mexican jokes for you people to, to understand what background I'm from, and I've talked about it numerous times. Take it as a person from one of these underprivileged backgrounds that you hear college students and college professors going on and on about us being repressed and and everything, right? We are not, okay? We don't really give a damn about representation as much as people think we do. Reason being because we had badasses that we grew up with. Like, we had people that were our heroes growing up. And again, I hate to be constantly bringing it back to this example, but I had a, a discussion with a friend. Um, I believe he is about 38. I'm 30. So he was talking, we were talking about wrestling, and, you know, he was talking, but he was naming names from an era that I could barely just remember watching. He's naming names like Sergeant Slaughter. Uh, Raddy Piper, Jake the Snake Roberts, Dwight the Clown, Jerry Lawler, like people he grew up watching. Hey, uh, I remember into... those guys. <laughs> yeah, of course you would. <laughs> I wouldn't, but when I was watching their stuff, most of the stuff that I watched from theirs was already stuff that was recorded, you know, years ago that I was just watching at, uh, when I was a kid. You know, most of them had already done this stuff. I thought it was happening in that current moment. I didn't understand as a child you know what I was watching was a pre-recorded thing. So when I saw Hulk Hogan, uh, this is a funny example. When I saw Hulk Hogan um, um, attacked by Earthquake, who I believe was Tugboat before then, um, I'm not too sure of the history, but you know who later became Earthquake, um, you know, and sent him to the hospital. I thought Hulk Hogan was dead. I didn't understand as a kid that that was just a pre-recording. And when I saw him come back to life, I was like, he is, he is a superhero. He came back and he's gonna fight this guy. And he, sure enough, he beat him. So to me, my that was my conception as a kid. I, I, those are memories I've always hold fondly. But you know, we were talking about these names. My buddy, he's Puerto Rican. I'm not actually Mexican, but I'm I'm Latino. I'm in a very in that Mexicanish category. I really don't like to talk about where I'm from for no reason in particular. I just don't we like didn't notice, really. huh? <laughs> we, we, we already noticed. Notice. Yeah. Go but ahead. The, but the thing is that you yeah, there were also Latino wrestlers. There was Pedro Morales. Tito Santana. But have you ever heard them be in the top of our lists? Like, if we were to name our favorite wrestlers of all time, notice how most of them just happen to be predominantly white. And you know why that is? Because to us, they were the exotic character. They were the character that we looked up to because that's what they meant to us. We didn't care about whether they looked like us. We just cared that we wanted to be like them. We wanted to be the hero. If there ever was a chance, it, it, like I would say this much: when it came to Latino wrestlers that wrestled, 
like it wouldn't be till much much later when we got like Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero when you started hearing um more people in the Latin American community talking about representation and stuff like that. That is years later after the names that I just mentioned like Morales and Tito Santana who were pretty still stars in their own right. You know, they were big names still back in um I believe late eighties, early nineties. So you want to talk about representation? We don't care. So stop making these movies like, oh, we need to have a, a Latin American Terminator now or whatever. I don't know what the movie's gonna be about. And I really don't frankly don't care. I saw Terminator One. I was scared shitless as a child. <laughs> That's why I never watched it ever again. Uh, not, but obviously as an adult, I wouldn't mind watching it. Terminator Two, uh, obviously. Um, I saw it too as a child, uh, and just needless to say, I was scared shitless a second time. So, look at that, right? Terminator Three, I saw. I didn't think it was hot shit, but the ending was okay. I enjoyed it. Arnold Schwarzenegger came back as a badass. That's all I cared about. I, I don't look at what color Arnold Schwarzenegger is. Uh, he did another movie that I thoroughly enjoyed called End of Days, where he fought the devil. I didn't care about his skin color. I just cared that he was fighting the devil, you know, the ultimate uh, villain. You know, it's a cheesy movie. It sucks, but I don't care. I just enjoyed the fact that he was fighting the villain. So stop. These these Hollywood directors, they need to stop. And, and these people in Hollywood and these corporations, everything. stop trying to make it about diversity. Stop listening to that vocal, my, that vocal minority, that, that the one that speaks the loudest. They don't understand what they're not, uh, what's going on. All right. They they're really the ones that are out of touch with the rest of the world because some college professor fed them some nonsense about God. What is it like this time now? White privilege or then privilege or all those other privileges. Just make badasses again. Get people who are, you know, tough looking dudes. I'm not saying get somebody as exaggerated like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but give me some badass that's on the screen. You know, like, you know what? Chris Evans does a fine enough job as Captain America. Whichever your opinions might be on the Captain America movies, he does a fine enough job as a character. We just want that. We just want to be entertained. Don't worry about appealing to a certain demographic. If it is good on its own right, then it's gonna be then we're gonna go watch it regardless of what race or gender the person on the screen is. It happened before, there's precedence of it. So it can happen again. If you keep trying to appeal to us, we really don't want to be reminded of people that you know, look so much like us sometimes. Like sometimes we do want to see people who are a little bit different of us because that's part of the, I guess, the intrigue. Like it's it's what brings us, it draws us. You know, opposites attract. That's the kind of thing. So this is my open letter. Please stop pandering to us. Stop listening to the vocal minority that think they know better and just make a solid movie and stop rebooting all these things like Terminator it was good while it, you look at the last couple movies from what I understand they sucked ass just let it be and make something different is that so much is that so hard to ask for yeah oh, as as Nick would say just, just let it die man just just let it die <laughs> that is true he would say that so oh, I felt like I talked that one to death too much but I think it. I, I just. I just. It just bothers me. Like we. Why are we still with this pandering nonsense? I thought we were past this. No, it's only going to get worse for a while. All right. Yeah. Uh, so I. I. Um. That's all the news I've got. I mean, I do. We have a couple other topics we want to cover. Uh, did you want to talk about the? Um, you had something that you wanted to talk about. I forget what it was. Oh, yeah, that was my whole joke about the curry powder earlier. It was about, uh, so I know we talked a while back, this guy that some Hindu guy from Brooklyn who had a problem with the character Apu in The Simpsons made a documentary about it. Honestly, the only thing I could say about that documentary is that it reminded me of a documentary that some Mexican guy, I'm assuming that at least that would be his correct Latino ethnicity. He made some documentary on MTV about white people. I saw like the first few minutes of it. It was just, you know, white guilt cringe. And like I said, going back to it, like, I don't understand why we have to be doing this to people. You know, the, you talk about the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. Well, apparently us minority folks are not treating other people any better. So I don't understand why we deserve any sympathy. 
But going back to the point of Apu, Simpsons apparently gave their response. Um, I think this episode came out last Sunday. Um, I believe this. Oh, yeah, it actually came out on the Sunday of WrestleMania. Uh, obviously, that means that nobody was watching The Simpsons except for a select few or people that did not care about wrestling. But anyways, so there was a basically the majority of the first half of the episode was a book that Marge read as a child that she wanted to read to Lisa about some girl who, you know, was during the ages of, I don't know, um, you know, like those 1800 eras, you know, where political correctness did not really exist. And I, I, it's just, it was just such a dumb episode. So where it really got cringy, was the point that Marge saw the book and she's like, oh, wow. It kept, it, it, she started editing the book so that she would read it a certain way to Lisa. And then after a while, Lisa just, uh, Marge is like, well, I don't know what to do. Like, everything in this book is offensive. I shouldn't be reading this to you. You're going to get the wrong idea. And Lisa says, well, you know, there, you know, before people used to view things a certain way that which we don't view it now. But there was this thing where they broke the fourth wall and they actually talked to the audience about how things that weren't acceptable for, uh, were acceptable before aren't acceptable now. And that the world might not be able to handle that sort of thing. And maybe that's a conversation for another time. And as the camera is panning out, you see a picture of Apu on Lisa's nightstand that says, don't have a cow man. And apparently this got people pissed off. Fans, because the guy who came out with the document, I even forgot what his name was at this point. I don't even care anymore. It was just a clusterfuck. To me, it was a horrible episode. It was even a horrible response. They were probably better off killing the Apu character off, and it would probably been a much better response than the crap that they pulled with this fourth wall nonsense. I don't understand. Nick is right. Just let it die already. Simpsons needs to go. Just die. You've had more bad seasons than you've had good seasons. Let that sink in. Yeah, it's like there's more bad Star Wars films than there are good ones. So, Wait, are we counting the, the Christmas one? <laughs> well, in the two Ewok adventures. Oh, uh, shit. So the only other couple things I had um, as we start to close this, this episode out is... Uh, so WCBS has been doing some live streams. Um, yeah. Jeff's been doing some things with some other people. Uh, last night they had a live stream for the Friday the 13th. They went, they were doing a marathon. I think originally they were going to do all the movies. Uh, but the, they looked and there's another one in July and the listeners spoke and voted and said, yeah, let's wrap it up and do it again in July. So I was on for the last part of, I forget which one, and then for all of Jason uh, X. That was a good one. And, um, you know, they really appreciated uh, Drunk Me. I had um, I had shot five beer reviews. Uh, for some reason, during Jason X, I grabbed a sixth one. It was one I'd already reviewed, so I was just drinking out of the bottle, which was bad because uh, I don't have enough oxygen with it. But uh, the, they were all, and it was also on an empty stomach, and they were, I think the lowest one I was drinking was 6.5%. So they were all not uh, slouches. So it was a good time, though. Uh, I look forward to uh, the next one if I can make it. Um, also, uh, listeners, the other thing that I'm trying to get set up, uh, and I've got to finalize some dates with Jeff, and that is the review of Spinal Tap. I don't know if that's going to be a Patreon only or not. I don't know if we're going to live stream. I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, but about t- almost two weeks before my uh, 50th birthday, the Jungle Gems Beer Fest is on a Friday. I'm, I'm set to do a Friday night. So that ends at, I want to say, 9. This is where i got to double-check the times. Um, and then I'll have somebody pick me up from that, and I'll be well sauced enough to do the Spinal Tap review, Drunken uh, Commentary. I haven't watched Spinal Tap probably since the 80s, the whole thing. Um, so, and I'm not going to watch it again until we do the review. So this is one of the benefits of being a patron of WCBS, uh, patron, and, uh, you know, if a certain, uh, I forget what level it is, um, and you can do things with this. I think somebody, was it, um, wasn't Kalen Webb, it was um, 
because he's been on this show. Um, what's his name? Help me out here, man. Um, he did the Amazing Spider-Man with him. Was it Justin B? I thought it was Justin. I thought it was Justin Beck. Is it him? I thought so. So I think uh, it was Justin B. You know, because it was um because we had him on the show a few times, and I remember he mentioned something about. I have my memory shit. Um, yeah, this is this uh, word to the wise. Never tell me, never give me a top secret. Um, I'd probably be likely to forget it. <laughs> uh, damn. Um, I believe it was him. I don't think it was anybody else. Um, no. So, uh, but anyway, that's a, a good thing. I'm going to get some more t-shirts. Um, I'm not going to Matsurikon this year for the first time in years. Uh, because oh, there's God, another, no. Why? There, Why not? There's another convention in Indianapolis that uh, they've asked me to attend. So I'm going to be going to Indianapolis that weekend. So, Wait a second. Who Did the, the, the people on the show ask you to attend it? Or uh, like did the con ask you to attend it? Jeff, no. <laughs> yeah, that is a bit of the pronoun <laughs> game. WCBS. So Jeff and, uh, okay. and, and Nick asked me about attending. This was after hey. we were done and we ended the live stream. We probably talked for another half an hour before we wrapped it up. And uh, so I'm definitely going to get some more T-shirts, make them show up in some of my re- reviews. I've been editing. Uh, you know, Last week, this past week, I got, I got no editing done because I was just lazy. Uh, I'm working on another Star Wars-related uh, video. Um, I recorded the okay. audio almost two weeks ago, and I'm finally I'm working on. And, I, and I've, I'm collecting images and things. It's another slideshow type thing, but I think I'm going to leave some of the gaps in. There's It, it has a little bit more impact, and so I'm going to leave some of that. But uh, there are going to be some, I won't say Easter eggs, but there, there, are, so there are certain ways that I'm presenting certain Star Wars movies, uh, and it's on purpose, and I want to see if people pay attention and uh, notice that, unfortunately, maybe in some ways I've ruined it, but we'll see. So you got any other topics before we announce the BBC and get out of here? No, I've been pretty much doing talking all night. Uh, I don't think I even really talked about anything I wanted to talk about other than the Apu thing and that just sucked the piss out of me too so let's right. just wrap it up alright man so also check out the High Council which is another uh, that's with Jeff and uh, Diversity in Comics and Comic something pro Comic Critiques pro anyway was, uh, uh, God I always get that name wrong yeah. I, I, like I get um Diversity in Comics wrong all the time too yeah so check that out. I don't know if they've decided on which day of the week they're going to do that. Um, and anyway, so this week's BBC, we've kind of keep it with a Marvel theme. And it's going to be uh, Haley Atwell. Agent, Agent Carter. Agent Carter herself. She is the BBC this week. And we'll have nice images. I actually am done with the thumb. While you were talking, I finished the thumbnail. And we're ready to rock. And the dogs need to go out. So... Give your sign off, LMP, and we'll get out of here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as part of my um, my quest to prove that the Earth is flat, I just saw a plane fly into the sky. Now, if you think about it, if the Earth was round, that plane would have probably flown right into space from Earth. But because the Earth is flat, it is still in the sky. See? The logic works. All right, I have been your host, Brain Muffin, the Lifting Nerd. I'm going to start the bumper music. Good night. Good night.